this morning. This lesson is about Easter. I'm putting Tyndale to sleep now in the evenings and the sun is still up, uh, which means that uh, the sun is shining greater than half the day. You know, of course, that happens after what scientists call the uh, vernal equinox, which is when half the day is sunshine, half the day is dark, right? And now this, there's more sunshine in day than there is dark, and so my son goes to bed when it's still light, and it'll continue to do so until June and July. Um, also, this last Tuesday after Bible study, a small group of us were outside looking at the moon, which was a very large moon and a full moon. Uh, and you say, why are you telling us these things, astronomical events? Because this is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox, which is how they date Easter. That's why today is Easter, and every year it changes, because every year the moon cycles and the vernal equinox is on a, you know, a, a, that relationship's different. And so it's the first Sunday of the first full moon of the vernal equinox, and thus it's Easter time, and that's why uh, people around the nation and the world uh, come together to, sell, I mean, wait a minute, how they come together during the stay-at-home orders. There's been a great Easter shutdown. Easter has been closed, apparently. 93% uh, of churches, and that was a week and a half ago, are closed down and are not having large gathering meetings. Uh, neither are we, by the way, having a large gathering. And, and so um, there's this whole uh, conversation being had, uh, even at the national level, about is Easter something worthwhile putting a pause on the stay-at-home orders and the lockdowns and the shutdowns? Is that something worthwhile of releasing uh, people from the uh, protection orders in order to celebrate this great day of Christianity? President Trump at one point said that he was hoping that uh, we would be able to remove the lockdowns for Easter. Well, here's Easter. They haven't been removed. We see controversies and arguments happen between states where certain states have lockdowns, other states don't. And uh, certain states, I think it was down in Kansas where the governor issued a lockdown, and the legislature passed a law contrary to the lockdown, making an exception for Easter. So there's political battles going on, and who decides this, and should Christians go anyway? And uh, so this is what's going on. And so it's a, a strange time, and there are people today doing things today that they think is right. There, there are others, they're encouraging others to do what they think is right. And much of the world's participating in the suspension of judgment. Um, even if it's a little inconvenient and it doesn't align totally with the facts, they're continuing doing what they're told to do today. They say it's better to do something than nothing and we can get some good memories out of it. So why, why not do it? Um, there are a few who point out the errors in their thinking and what they're doing. And there's even a, a few that, though their intentions be good, are resisting, you know, following the crowd and just opposing it, you know, wildly. Um, it's not based on the facts. There is a better way, a way that even God would have us do. Uh, at large, these people, these few that oppose what everyone's doing today, um, are mocked, ridiculed, scoffed, and scorned. You know, they say, well, are these, these, these memories, so-called, this, this experience, this global unity around doing something you think is right, worth sacrificing what we know to be true? Does the end justify the means? Is it worth shutting down what is most important and settling for less? And I hope you know I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm talking about Easter. <laughs> I'm about Easter. What we're doing today and suspending their judgment and doing what they think is right, and everyone's participating in it. And there's a few that say, maybe we should question that, and they get mocked and ridiculed. But you see the relationship, it's very interesting. I'm not talking about coronavirus, I'm talking about Easter. It's Easter time, Easter's been shut down. Or has it been shut down? Churches, churches are as empty as Jesus' tomb, the curtains are closed on the pageants, and the egg hunts are spoiled. They can't have them this year. And I was worried about teaching a lesson on Easter today because I don't want people to think of me as a Grinch. And uh, I know that Easter is very personal for people. There's a lot of personal uh, memories and involvement with it. And my brother encouraged me that this is an opportune time to talk about Easter. And I thought, you know, you're right. And the reason why is not just because it's Easter. It's because at this, this historical time in our culture, okay, religions and religious rituals and holy days and the, all that is put on the table for question. Okay. People are now having to defend since Easter church services are canceled and since the Easter uh, practices, religious practices are canceled, they're having to defend and they will have to defend the return to that sort of normal. 
They have to defend whether we should do Easter or not. That's the conversation. Should Christians perform Easter this year? Should they participate in it? Should we do it? And in fact, uh, it's interesting how people are actually fighting, even though they're for the lockdowns or for the shutdowns, we're not for those things at Easter. Why? Why not Easter? Answer? That's the great day of Christianity, right? That's a special day. That's a holy Christian day. In fact, all week we've been hearing, as we hear every year, that it's Holy Week. The very same week President Trump said this will be a, day, a week of carnage. You know, well, that fits right into Christianity. Jesus died this week, you know, 2,000 years ago. And so is it something that we should participate in or not? Churches are empty. The curtains are closed. Egg hunts are canceled. And governors are doing what fundamentalists have tried for a century and a half to do and could never do, which is shutting down religion. I didn't know it was that easy. Well, it's not been easy. There's been a pandemic and all sorts of misery and everything else, not making light of that. But even with all of that, all the churches closed. They've been recommending live streaming and, and finding uh, what they can in their Easter services other ways. And so there's been stories of churches having drive through Easter. Have you heard of that? where they stay in their cars and they, they kind of drive in, kind of like a drive-in movie. And because the, the, if you're in your car, you're six feet away from each other and the window's up and you can hear through the radio. They're having like drive-in meetings at Easter, uh, just for Easter. Uh, a lot of people are streaming their, their message and people are joining online, live streaming and recordings. We've been doing that for years, of course, our messages. So there's different ways people are handling it. Um, this morning at 10, we passed the moment, but there was a movement to go outside of your house. Is everyone staying at home? And at 10 o'clock, Christians around the country would go out of their house at 10 o'clock and yell, Hallelujah! You know, and it's like, it's like unity, you know, Easter. And of course, there's no sunrise meetings this morning because that's, that'd be social gathering and we're social distancing. And so um, there's no sunrise meetings. So how do you do that? Well, the people are explaining how you can do it in your home. It's just different. when You're not together doing it. Um, the family photos that people take at, e at church at Easter are, are canceled, unfortunately. So it's like, what do you do? Well, maybe take some pictures at home, but your pajamas don't look as good. And so, what's happening here? And what we're seeing is that even though there's shutdowns and churches are closed, it has not stopped Easter from coming. Even though the government, I mean, the Grinch stole Easter, right? And this is why it's great for me to talk about it, because I don't have to be the Grinch this year. I didn't shut down Easter. I didn't do it. The virus did it, Right? But the virus took away your chocolate bunnies and took away your egg hunts and took away your Easter services and your morning breakfast meals at Easter. Took all those away, sunrise services. And yet Easter came. Just like the Who's down in Whoville, Christians have gone to social media and said, this can't stop Easter from coming. And so they start singing. And they sing in their individual homes on social media. And it's not something that you can take away. Easter is not bought from a store, right? It's not in the packages you get in Easter morning with the bunny and the eggs. It's not simply the sunrise services and meeting together in, uh, with the palm leaves last Sunday. Easter, perhaps, is a little bit more. That's what Christians are saying this year. This year they're saying it. And I'm on board in this conversation going, this is an interesting conversation. What really is Easter if it's not all those things that we've canceled because of the virus? What is it really, right? Is it perhaps something a little bit more like Dr. Seuss said in his famous tale, the, the Grinch that stole Christmas? Well, the Grinch has stole Easter this year. So what's that question? Da hu dore. You know, what does that mean? We don't know. So the shutdown is really challenging churches. It's challenging traditions. It's challenging religious practices, which I think is great. Deaths, not happy about. Sicknesses, not happy about. People being foolish, not good. Okay. But questioning religious traditions, this, perhaps a silver lining, that's a good conversation to have. Okay, we've been trying to do that for a while. What is Easter about? What is the true meaning of Easter? And should grace believers specifically, those of us who know how to rightly divide the scripture, know the revelation of the mystery, know the gospel of the grace of God, should we participate in the annual religious practice of a holy day of Easter? Should we? So I'm going to lay it on the table very frankly. Should we do it? Yes or no? Now, I, I know you probably know my answer. You're gonna, he's going to say no. I get it. But do you know why? Okay. It's not because I'm a Grinch. It's not because I don't like your family. It's not because I don't like marshmallows or chocolate. It's none of that. Okay, there is a doctrinal reason why. You see, I care about Scripture, and I know you do too, which is why the lesson, right? What's wrong with Easter this year? Well, the first thing wrong is that people can't do it the way they've normally been doing it. That's in people's eyes. What's wrong is this is a very unique time, and we're not doing Easter the way we usually do it. But does that stop it from coming? 
And Christians say, no, it doesn't. You can't stop Easter from coming. Well, then what is it? Okay, what is it really? Let's talk about that. And that's the conversation I want to have. Let's boil down Easter. Okay. Now, when we talked about holidays before, we, we talk about it in the context of the Bible rightly divided. We talk about it as far as the doctrine we communicated in different holy days. And I think it's easier sometimes for people to grasp the, the error okay, of focusing on, let's say, the, uh, the baby Jesus here. There's the baby Jesus. It's a toddler Jesus, right? Crawling Jesus. Focusing on, it looks nasty, doesn't it? It's, it's the baby Jesus, right? That's not our focus. We don't focus and preach the baby Jesus. We preach the cross of Jesus, not the cradle, but the cross. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. You know, baby Jesus is, is not what saves you, even though his incarnation was necessary and he was a baby and he did grow. Important things to believe and know. And yet the cross of Christ is our message. We glory in the cross of Christ, Galatians 6, 14. So that this is easier to grasp. But when it comes to Easter, have you had this thought? I know many of you have kind of asked me. You know, I, I get Christmas, but what about Easter? Because isn't Easter about the true meaning? Beyond the chocolate bunnies and the paganism and the traditions, isn't it about the cross of Christ? So what's wrong with Easter, right? What's the deal with that? Should we do it? Let's boil it down a little bit, just to make sure we're talking about the same things. I don't want any miscommunication uh, mis uh, here. Because I believe in Easter. I've said it for the record. I believe in it. You say, whoa, what's that mean? I'm going to explain it. I believe that Easter should be the word you use in Acts 12, verse 4. The King James Bible is the only Bible of many that has the word Easter in it. It's amazing to me that I defend the King James Bible and using the word Easter in Acts 12, verse 4, and folks who actually practice Easter don't want that word there. You can pretty much tell which Bible you're using by that word Easter. If you see the word Easter in Acts 12, verse 4, you're probably using the King James Bible or an English Bible that came before the King James Bible in that tradition, or a modern variation of the King James Bible. Right? The NIV, the NASB, and all the, you know, they, they don't have the word Easter there. Another topic for another day, look at our verse by verse in the book of Acts to study that issue out. Okay? That word Easter was in the mind of a pagan king, number one. Secondly, it had to do with Peter, James, and John's ministry with Jesus and their kingdom ministry. And thirdly, it is the only time in your Bible where that word, and I'm going to mention the Greek word Pascha because that's the controversy, is used in the context about a day after Jesus resurrected. Only time, which is why it should be Easter and should remain Easter, and the other places should be Passover. Anyway, that's not the topic today. Read our Acts verse by verse, you'll know more about that. But I believe in Easter. I think that word should stay there. Okay, that's the appropriate word. But I, I don't believe in the eggs and the marshmallow chicks and that sort of thing. I eat eggs for breakfast, and I like chicken, okay, and, and ham's fine too, okay, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But Easter, can we agree for our conversation today, is not that. I mean, I can rant and rail about, you know, the, 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 the marshmallows and the consumerism and all that stuff in Easter. I'm not going to do that today, right? So it's not about the boiled eggs and the colored eggs. It's not about the marshmallow chicks. It's not about the ham, which Jesus would never have eaten in his earthly ministry anyway. Right? Jesus didn't eat pork, he didn't ham, but that's another question for you to ask yourself. And the weirdly shaped chocolate bunnies. Right? So chocolate in a weird shape. Which I, have a, I have a question about chocolate shaped bunnies, or bunny shaped chocolate. Right? Is whether or not vegans eat them, like vegetarians. Because it's not an animal, but it's shaped like an animal. So I'm just curious, if any vegetarian Christian, I mean, what do you do with you know, bunny-shaped chocolate? Anyway, uh, but it's chocolate, and you know, that's fine, and it, it's good to eat. And so if you want to talk to your kids about birds and the bees and that sort of thing, then fine, just don't lie to them. Okay, it's springtime, life, new life, eggs, bunnies, fertility. Talk to your kids, just don't lie to them, okay, that there's some magical bunny dropping off those eggs. Mom cooked them on the stove, and we colored them, and it was a good time. Okay, so, but we're not talking about that today. We're also saying that Easter is not paganism. Okay, it is a little bit. But that's not the conversation today. And by the way, the fact I said it's a little bit should not be a shock to any of you. Okay, this is not new information. If you don't know that, you should look it up. It's pretty common knowledge between Christians and non-Christians that the, a lot of traditions associated with the Easter celebrations have origins in paganism and over the years have been uh, you know, taken by Christians, Roman Catholics and others to be a part of the tradition and so on and so forth. Not even going to deal with it. Okay? Because I don't believe that the pagan origins of traditions is the proper response that we should have to Easter, even though that's something you should know. I mean, I would like to know where these things that we do come from. People say, well, it's the same like your calendars, the, the calendar months and the days on your calendar are named after pagan gods. That's true. But I didn't choose the calendar. I get to choose what I participate in. It's a big difference. But it's not about paganism. Let's say Easter's not paganism. 
okay? And it's not just family tradition. Let's, let's remove that from the equation. You see, our family gets together, a large gathering every year, right? And it's, it's great. We get to see family again. It's just traditions. It's just good times. It's symbols, right? Easter is full of symbols, right? It's, uh, the eggs symbolize life and resurrection. The, you know, the bunnies symbolize life and resurrection. <laughs> Everything symbolizing life and resurrection. So there's symbols everywhere. Of course, the problem with symbols, of course, is it's not clear communication. To make it a symbol, you have to hide the truth behind a symbol. That's the point of a symbol, right? It represents something. How do you know what it represents? You gotta learn something else. You know what's clearer than symbols? Just saying it outright. <laughs> just saying the truth. You don't need the symbol then. You just say it, right? You just speak it. But it's, let's say it's not about family traditions, it's not about the symbols. And I say that because in this, this pandemic, that's why this is the opportunity to talk about this now, is that you can't have your large family gatherings, right? Perhaps those have been canceled. Family traveling across the country or whatever, coming together for Easter. It's a big day, an important day. You're all going to church or something. And that stuff may have been affected by this pandemic. Social stay at home, social distancing, right? So does that prevent Easter from happening? The fact that you don't have your annual Easter gathering. So you see, I haven't, it's been boiled down by the situation. I, I'm not even, it's not hard to picture what I'm trying to present here. Okay, because the events at churches have been canceled, because uh, people really, even though there's paganism behind it, they don't think about Eastern paganism. They just, it's not a thing. They're like, I'm going to go pagan worship today. They don't think about that. And the family traditions and things is they really enjoy. It's very personal for them. But this year, a lot of things are being sacrificed in the name of the, the virus. And so we're in a situation where what's left? What truly is Easter? Right? You see where I'm at here? You see why this is a great opportunity to deal with the situation doctrinally? Because everything else has been removed. All the other distractions in the conversation that get people to speak past each other have been taken off the table by the pandemic and the government. And it's just like what's left is, can we have Easter this year at all? And Christians are responding with, yes, we can, just a different way. Right? Yes, we can, because true Easter, the real meaning of it, is not in the bunnies, and it's not even in the family gatherings, and it's not just in the symbols and in the places and in the, the sunrise services. It's something else. Good. I want to know the central core, true meaning of Easter. Right? What is it? And, of course, every good Christian should know, though many don't. Okay? But they should. Right? What's left? Well, Easter is about the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but the resurrection of Christ, the death and the resurrection of Christ. It's he is risen. Christians say that, right? Going back for centuries. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed, right? And I believe in the resurrection, right? It's hope, right? It's new life that Christ has been given as he rose from the dead and offers it to you. It's hope, right? I believe in hope. If we boil down Easter and remove all the paganism and all the traditions and all the symbols and all the nonsense that happens through the years and say Easter is about Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and, his, and the hope that Jesus brings through that, right? What about that? That's what we're talking about. Agreed? That's what we're dealing with today, all right? If that's Easter, what's wrong with it? Because that's the question. There should be no question. What's wrong with paganism? Well, it's wrong. What's wrong with, you know, worshiping bunnies? Well, no one does that, but it, those are just candies, right? Just fun and good times. What's wrong with family traditions? Nothing's wrong with family and family traditions. But that's not really Easter. Easter is the death and resurrection of Christ and the hope that he brings. You say, Justin, you can't argue against that. You are going to be a Grinch here. You're going to take that away. This is, this is Bible truth. Now I'm going to rightly divide Easter. Because what happens at Easter is something very strange. And I think it happens because of those things we just removed. It happens because of the personal involvement, the memories. It happens because of the good times and the fun. It happens because of just what they do every year's tradition. People who know how to rightly divide suspend their judgment and neglect to rightly divide Easter from any other day of the year. Okay, let me show you how that happens. When it comes to tithing, Right? When it comes to water baptism, when it comes to the law, when it comes to the Sabbath, when it comes to signs of spiritual gifts, what, do, what is our cry? And I'm talking here about people who rightly divide. We say, you need to rightly divide the scriptures. It's in the Bible. Tithing's in the Bible. What do you say? Not everything in the Bible is dispensational. It's not always God's will. You have to discern what his will is for today. Right? That's our mantra all the time. You've got to rightly divide the scripture. What about keeping the Sabbath day? Well, you've got to rightly divide the scripture. We're not under the law, and that was for Israel, not for us. And we're fine with that. Even though your friends oppose you, even though it's a contrary to the Christian culture, you say, we need to understand the Bible, the Bible alone, we need to rightly divide. Right? Okay. Then when it comes to Easter, what's the grace response? Who cares? 
Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Like, shouldn't we be asking, is this the will of God to participate in Easter? Well, who cares? It's just good times. No, we already established it's not that. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus, and it's hope from Jesus Christ, right? Death and resurrection of Jesus. It's his death, the crucifixion on the cross. Remember the beating? The, the pageants always participate in this, right? In the resurrection. We'll draw the resurrection here. Here we go. But who cares about Easter? Well, I would think that you should care as God's ambassador, his servant of the Lord, the soldier of the cross, to care about how you communicate Jesus Christ. So is the message about Easter, the message you in the church at large is communicating? Or not? Who cares about tithing? People are giving money, aren't they? Well, yeah, it matters a lot because it's not just about the money. It's about the intent of their heart, right? If you give un tithing under the law and you think, well, this is a requirement of the law for me to get spiritual blessing, you are diminishing the work of Jesus Christ, right? We minister grace giving versus tithing, right? You say water baptism, who cares? Well, if people are trusting water baptism for the remission of their sins, it's a big problem because Christ died for your sins and his blood provided forgiveness, right? So we need to rightly divide the scriptures and understand the gospel revealed today. It's a big issue, right? And so why is Easter get an exemption? And like I said, today when people are, have to boil down Easter to the bare minimum of what it really is in their heart, this is a great conversation to have. <clears throat> Let's draw a simple dispensational chart here. You have Jesus as a baby, right? You have Jesus uh, walking on the water, right? You have Jesus teaching the law, right? We've got the Ten Commandments here. We have Jesus observing. We'll have Jesus uh, sitting down. There's his uh, table, like in the, in, the, in the Passion movie, Jesus made tables, right, in chairs. So he's at the table eating his Easter ham. That's wrong. The Passover meal. Baby, he grew up, walked on water, he taught the law, eating the Passover, not the ham, right, the lamb, at the Passover meal. Died in the cross, rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit came back, and here's Peter. And what's Peter preach? Okay. He preaches prophets, right? And he preaches prophets, and Jesus fulfilled the prophecies, and you killed Jesus, and he rose from the dead, but you killed him, and repent, and, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and receive the Holy Ghost for the remission of sins. And then they stone Stephen. Remember the stoning of Stephen? And what happens in Acts 9? You have a mystery revealed. Now, I'm doing this really quick because we've done dispensational charts before. And to Paul, we have this mystery of Christ. Mystery revealed of Christ to the Apostle Paul. And so we talk about being mid-Acts and Pauline and dispensational, understanding that what Christ revealed through the Apostle Paul's instructions for the church. And, you know, in Jesus' earthly ministry, he ministered to Israel under the law. And he died there. And the Holy Spirit came down and Peter spoke prophecy about a coming kingdom. Right? And you can draw more details if you'd like to this chart. That's the dispensational chart, right? This is what we study week in and week out. This is what we learn from the Bible that divided. It's what's delivered us from the bondage of the law as, as we're put under it and through false understanding. It's what gives us the knowledge and hope and assurance of His grace, the hope of glory, and all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ is understanding what God is doing through the Scripture. Right? God's will. When you talk about Easter, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what I mean about the resurrection, because that's why you have the sunrise services. Even though Jesus didn't raise from the dead at, at, when the sun was out, it was yet dark when he rose from the dead, probably on that Sabbath or Saturday evening. It wasn't even Sunday that he rose from the dead, which may be traditionally her heretical to you, but uh, he rose from the dead. No matter what time he did it, he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, he preached the kingdom to his disciples for 40 days, and sent them the Holy Spirit, and Peter prophesied the kingdom. So you have the resurrection here preached by Peter. Okay, and typically Easter pageants stop before the Holy Ghost has come down, right? So the Easter pageants, sometimes they'll go back to his birth, but sometimes it'll start in his earthly ministry. Let's draw. Here is the Easter pageant right here, right? Anybody see an Easter pageant? Easter cantata, these, isn't that right? They, they, it's Jesus' life, sometimes his birth is included, to the resurrection. That's, that's like the closed curtain, right? Rose from the dead, shine the lights, glorious hallelujah chorus is singing, and everyone's, yes, he rose from the dead. And then, in credits, pass plates, happy Easter, everybody. Resurrection. We're Christians. We believe in resurrection from the dead. Amen. I believe in Jesus and his resurrection. I'm a Christian. Right? 
True or false? Think about it. Why do we suspend our need to rightly divide on this day of the year? What's missing from every Easter pageant plot? There's a major character missing. And yes, Jesus is the Lord and Savior and above all, but where do you learn that he's above all principality and power? From the writings of the Apostle Paul. Where do you learn about the glorified, heavenly, resurrected Jesus who is above all things heaven and earth? The Apostle Paul. Without the apostle of the Gentiles, without the apostle of the resurrection, you're missing important, pertinent information about Jesus' resurrection. Amen. And yet every pageant ends before Paul even gets on, before even Peter gets on the scene, as far as his Pentecostal ministry. Right? Every Easter pageant is missing Paul. Who cares about Paul? It's about Jesus. Really? You who rightly divide. You grace believer, you. Don't you know we preach Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery? Or do you think we just preach Jesus any old way? Right? Now, if you're having that question, you need to go back to other lessons we've taught about that, right? It's not enough to preach Jesus. You have to preach him according to the revelation of the mystery. It's not enough just to preach Jesus in the cradle. You've got to preach Jesus on the cross. But not just Jesus at the cross. Jesus what he did by the cross, right? Mystery information. Easter shuts down before Paul. Easter shuts down before the revelation of the mystery, and there is no role you can play in any Easter pageant that will speak out of your mouth or exemplify by your actions the revelation of the mystery of Christ. Think about that. Should grace believers participate in Easter? Boiling it down, forget the paganism, forget the bunnies, forget the traditions, the family meals, forget, I mean, let's just say that all that's benign. What is the core central teaching? Jesus' death and resurrection. And when the pastor, Easter shuts down and Easter ends, you never learn about the mystery of Christ. That's a big problem, isn't it? Or these charts are meaningless. <laughs> you see, so I'm appealing to you as grace believers here, because I know there's lots of people who don't even understand this chart. And so the, their ignorance, it means you need to communicate, you know, that Jesus came back after he rose from the dead, and he came back and delivered to Paul this information about the church, the body of Christ, and about this, this walk that we have with him, this fellowship of the mystery. Easter, can I say it plainly here? Easter as we've defined it, his death and resurrection right here. Let's just make that clear on the board, because this is our definition of Easter that we're working with today. And I think most churches traditionally would define it as his death and resurrection. Okay? Easter is not part of the dispensation of the grace of God. Do you understand? This is not part of the dispensation of the grace of God. True or false? True. You see what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to, to, to grab you and say, Easter doesn't change right division. <laughs> right? What was true a week ago is still true during Holy Week. Right? What was true about how we ought to minister to people a week ago is still true how we ought to minister to people today. Just because you've been doing it for years and the church has been doing it for centuries and you've got sentimental value attached to it does not mean it's a failure to rightly divide. Right? And it has all the consequences of that as well. In fact, even more so, because it's not just about separating Old Testament from New, which a lot of Christians give lip service to. It's about separating Jesus' earthly ministry from Jesus' heavenly ministry, Peter's ministry from Paul. Isn't that what Menachem's right division really focuses on? Yeah. So I'm trying to bring to your, your knowledge here how you say, well, I understand the, cr the cradle and Christmas is the, the baby and not focused on the cross, but Easter seems like it's, that's right there. I'm trying to reorient your mind again. At the cross, nobody understood the gospel, right? You don't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ or any Easter movie or TV show. You don't because it never includes the parts of the Bible that have it, right? Now you say, well, I went to a church one time and at the very end they taught the clear gospel. Well, they did that in exception to traditional Easter tradition, right? So good for them, right? You say, well, I know the gospel of Christ, and so I can say it in Easter because I know it, but it's not because of Easter that you know it. You see what I'm saying? You say, I do Easter, and I know it doesn't include the gospel, but I know the gospel, so it's fine. Well, good for you. But that kind of undermines the idea that Easter is the big message of Christianity. We preach Jesus, we preach his death, we preach his resurrection according to the revelation of the mystery, without which there would be no Christianity today. There'd only be a legalistic, judo-Christian idea that you got to be under the law and do good behavior to get you to heaven, right? And Jesus opened the gate. That's not the gospel of the grace of God, okay? That's something different. 
Easter is not part of the dispensation of the grace of God. It's not mid-Acts. And if you know what that means, then you have ears to hear. Okay. Mid-Acts meaning where the church began, where you revealed the mystery. Okay. It's even before Acts 2. So it's not even Pentecostal. Right? So you have that issue. Eastern is rightly divided. Look at Acts 2.24. Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, he did. Amen. When someone comes to you and says, Jesus rose from the dead, preach it, brother. Amen. I'm not going to slap him in the face. Yes, I believe that. What? Yes. That is good. That is right. So, yeah, that's a, a, at least they moved past when he was, you know, when he was back in the baby eating baby food. You know, he's moved past that to the cross. Good. He died and he rose from the dead. And that's very important for the gospel that we preach, isn't it? Very important. But the fact that he died and the fact that he rose from the dead is not the gospel itself. Now, again, this isn't new information for those of you who rightly divide. If that is shocking information, then we have an issue of talking about different gospels. Right? When Christians think there's one gospel in the whole scripture, and that's just one, and that's all there is, even when it doesn't talk about the cross, it's just one, it's so amorphous and so vague and so broad that I guess anything in the Bible can be, you know, attached to that gospel. When you talk about the gospel of the kingdom being different than the gospel of the grace of God, and you see that necessary difference when you write light of the scripture, then you can't say, just believing Jesus died is the gospel. Because Jesus rose from the dead, yes, Peter preached that, right? I believe it, and so did Peter. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Peter's Pentecostal message was about Jesus fulfilling the prophets, and part of that prophetic fulfillment was his resurrection. He said, you men of Israel, verse 22, speaking to Israel, verse 23, um, you saw Jesus of Nazareth. You, you saw him confirmed, a, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain, condemning them for the cross. And verse 25, for David speaks concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, he is not on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore, did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. I, I think I passed verse 24. It talks about him being raised up. God has raised him up. Peter spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Right? Peter believed it. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 11. This is a passage, a, a, a most frequently asked question of uh, mid-Acts dispensationalism. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 11. You say Peter and Paul taught different messages. What about 1 Corinthians 15, 11? And I think the reason why people have problems with this verse is the same reason they have problems with Easter. Because they're related. Right. Doctrinally speaking. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 11. Paul is defending the veracity, the truthfulness of Jesus' resurrection. And he's doing so based on his gospel. And he's saying, look, our gospel, the one I preached to you, the one that you believed and that you received, right, is that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. So there's the gospel there. Right? And then he started defending this resurrection teaching and saying that without resurrection, then you're still in your sins. It's very crucial to our gospel today. Okay? In verse 11, he has evidence of the resurrection. He says, he was seen of those guys, and seen of these guys, and seen of all those guys. And last of all, he was seen of me as by God's grace. Right? And in verse 11, it says, Therefore, whether it were I or they, referring to Peter and the apostles, the other apostles, so we preach and so you believed. Doesn't that prove Paul and Peter taught the same thing? Not in every aspect. Yes, they both taught the God of the Bible. They both taught God manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ. They both taught Jesus' is, like he was alive and incarnate and he grew and walked and ministered to the circumcision. They both communicated that in Romans 15.8. They communicated his death. They communicated his resurrection. They communicated that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. They had all that in common. But what did Peter not teach? What was given to Paul? A mystery, Right? Peter didn't know or preach the mystery of Christ here at Pentecost in Acts 3. But what he did preach was resurrection. So Paul's saying, look guys, even Peter preaches the resurrection. Right? What's interesting about this thought that, G that Peter preached um, this gospel, look at Mark 16, 11, is that Peter, though he was preaching a gospel, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's called the gospel of the kingdom, right? And they were preaching Jesus as the Messiah, that message did not require the death and resurrection of Jesus. The coming kingdom and that message that here's the one that fulfills the prophecies and he's going to bring the kingdom in does not require his death and resurrection. 
Mark 16, 11. After Jesus rose from the dead, they went, um, and they, these are the women here, and they, when they had heard that he was alive, let me back up a few, verse 9. When Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. By the way, Mark 16, 9, I've got to say something here, because earlier I said he didn't rise in the morning. I know that from John 20. Right? In John 20, it says, while it was yet dark, the women went to the tomb. Mark 16, 9, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week. It's not describing necessarily when his resurrection occurred. It's saying now when Jesus was risen. He's risen today, folks. Okay? It's talking about when he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. That's what this is talking about. But anyway, out of whom he cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, look what the next two words say. Believe not. When Peter heard from Mary Magdalene that Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't believe it. Right. G Peter was not a believer in Easter, the resurrection, in Mark 16. He didn't preach it until Acts 2. By that time, he had seen Jesus multiple times, thus having the infallible proof that he was alive. Okay? But the point I'm making is in Mark 16, Peter, one of Jesus' 12 apostles, commissioned to communicate the gospel of the kingdom, and it was preaching throughout the book of Mark to Israel, this gospel was not preaching the resurrection of Christ. He only began preaching it at Pentecost as evidence, once again, that he was the king, which was the message he was preaching. Does it make sense? So the whole resurrection thing wasn't even essential for Peter's gospel. But if you're going to talk about an Easter gospel, then Peter is the one that preaches it. Because Easter refers to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and Peter preaches that. So who preaches the Easter gospel? Peter. Right? Peter preaches the Easter gospel. Acts 2.38, he says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Why would you be baptized for the dead? He's not dead, Peter preaches. He's risen from the dead. Right? And by the way, you get water baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, is what Peter says. In Acts 3.19, look at Peter's Easter gospel. If Easter is the death and resurrection of Jesus, Peter is communicating the death and resurrection of Jesus in Acts chapter 3. And then he says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the resurrected Lord. I added resurrected. Right? Peter's gospel is repentance for future forgiveness. It's a kingdom message. How many times we communicated Acts 3 and him speaking what the prophets spoke about is not the mystery what was kept secret since the world began. And what Peter preached here, this gospel about future forgiveness based on the blood of Jesus is not the same as present possession of all that information and knowledge and, and, and truth here. It's different, right? Different gospels. If Peter's preaching the Easter gospel and Easter is not found in Paul's gospel, what's that mean about Paul and Easter? Paul doesn't preach the Easter gospel. He preaches his resurrection, but he preaches his gospel, Christ according to the mystery. Right? He preaches Jesus' death and resurrection according to mystery. Not according to Easter. Right? Or, said another way, Easter is insufficient. It's lacking. Lacking some of the most important information. Namely, what did he accomplish by all of that? Right? You see? Now, this isn't a traditional Easter message, is it? It sounds like a normal dispensational message. I'm applying it to Easter because I know there's a struggle. And I understand the struggle. I get it. I was there too. Because right? you're trying to say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, it's a resurrection. That's good, right? Yes, the resurrection is good. But it's not enough just to preach it. Because if it's enough just to preach resurrection, then Peter and Paul have the same thing. Go ahead, preach Peter's gospel. You wouldn't do that, would you? Now, there's people out there that do, and Christianity at large does think that the same thing. So I understand why people, you know, participate in Easter, generally, who fail to rightly divide, because Peter and Paul had the same gospel, and Peter taught the gospel of Easter, so do it. Right? I could even defend that from the King James Bible in Acts 12, verse 4, if I wanted to. But if you know that Peter and Paul had a different gospel, this raises a question concerning Easter and the message it communicates. Right? Namely, is that it's not that it's wrong if we're talking about the resurrection of Christ. It's that it's not enough. We're not talking about works. We're talking about the gospel of grace that we actually communicate to people. It's not found in any Easter pageant. Is that making sense where I'm coming from here? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. 
People say the Bible says nothing about Easter. Well, firstly, if you have a King James Bible, the word is found in the Bible, but that's irrelevant. Secondly, it does say something about what people think Easter is if you're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, that is a key essential element of right division between Peter and Paul. So it says a lot about it. Yeah, you're not going to find a lot in here about yellow marshmallow chicks. That's true. Not, doesn't even talk about it. Right? That's not the point. It doesn't talk about how often your family should gather together and, you know, remember the, the, the warmness of the spring and, you know, flowers coming out or buying your grandma lilies. It is, that said nothing about that, you know. That's something, but it does say a lot about the resurrection of Christ. And if that is what the true meaning of Easter is, we need to understand that, rightly divided, it. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. Paul says about the resurrection, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins, if Christ be not raised. Right? That's his evidence. You see, Easter ends with an empty tomb. Amen? Yes. In fact, that, that's the best news about Easter, is that it ends with the empty tomb, and that is good. It's good news, right? But... What that little pull you feel like this sounds different than what I normally hear or study from the scripture is the pull of you understanding the mystery and knowing that you haven't yet gone far enough to get the information, right? That's where you're at. Paul, the Easter ends with the empty tomb. Paul's gospel, your gospel, begins with an empty tomb. And I'm not only talking about Jesus's. Because I'm not saying the gospel begins here at the cross. They didn't know the gospel of grace. Peter didn't know the gospel of grace 40 days after the cross. I'm talking about you being the empty tomb. Right? You being the empty vessel, spiritually dead, that needs salvation. How do you get the power of God to be saved? Right? Now, I mean, we've got to think doctrinally here. If Jesus rose from the dead and that was the end of the story, would that mean you were saved? No. The story must continue until Christ, resurrected in heavenly glory, returns and says, what I did, raised from the dead, is now being offered to you. And you can be risen with me. In fact, be crucified with me. And then be risen with me. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That is Paul's gospel. And it begins at the empty tomb. It doesn't end there. Right? You have to preach the empty tomb of Jesus applied to you. Do you get it? That's the mystery of Christ, and that's not the Easter message. Now, the fact that preachers may do that is because they have Paul in their Bible. But that's not what the Easter message is about. That's why the passages don't, don't go past that. Do you see the problem here? Look at Romans 4.25. Romans 4. The resurrection is essential to the gospel of the grace of God. It's the beginning of your message. Paul says about his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel I preach unto you first of all. He says, Christ died for your sins. He begins where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John ends. He rose from the dead. And from there he builds this information about how Christ returned to me and revealed to me the dispensation of the grace of God and gave me this information of the body of Christ. And you're a new creature in Christ, not an old thing, but a new thing. And there's this mystery information about what Christ did for you. Romans 4.25 says, resurrection, according to Paul's gospel here, is required for justification who was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for our justification. Resurrection, justification. That's not something Peter taught. That's not something Jesus taught over here. That was kept secret to reveal the Apostle Paul. That he died for your offenses and was raised again for your justification freely by faith through his grace. Romans 3, verse 20, 24. Right? That's part of the information. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 19. I'm going to try to show you. I am not trying to tear down Easter. In fact, like I said, I, I don't like being the Grinch. And so I, I, this year gives me the opportunity of not being that. Easter is not shut down by me. It's shut down by the virus and the government and everything else. And Christians say it's not the true meaning of Easter. That's the conversation I'm trying to have. That there's something greater than that, meaning, that true message of Easter that people have. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19. This verse here singularly points that out. Ephesians is the book talking about the mystery of Christ and the church, the body of Christ, says in verse 18 that he prays that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And that's what my hope is. I don't want to melt your chocolate bunnies down and turn them into something else, like chocolate crosses, which is a thing at Easter, chocolate crosses. I don't know what that means, eating the cross either. But Anyway, Ephesians 1 verse uh, 18 he wants your eyes of understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding. You see that word exceeding? What does that mean? 
it excels more than, right? It exceeds the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, what is his mighty power in verse 19 at the end? What is that? Look at verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You see that? The power that Christ had, that God had in Christ when he rose from the dead, the message of the mystery is that you can understand that that power that was in Christ when he rose from the dead is now given to you word. Right? Ephesians 1 verse 20, 20 says, He set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. How do you know you're going to heaven? It's not according to prophecy. It's not according to this message right here or uh, Peter's message of prophecy here, which was all an earthly kingdom message. You know you're going to heaven because Christ rose from the dead and the power to raise him up to heaven above all things is given to you word to sit with him in heaven above all things. Amen. That's a mystery message about the cross. Do you understand? Based on the resurrection. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The body of Christ is a mystery message communicated as a result of the resurrection, but not at the resurrection. Right? We have the song in our hymnal, At Calvary. At Calvary, at Calvary. And we change it to by Calvary because... Dispensationally speaking, at the cross, nobody knew what was going on but Jesus Christ himself. By the cross, however, as Christ revealed it to us later, <laughs> yes, that was the most important historical event in human history. And based on that information revealed in the mystery of Christ, we have this heavenly hope. We have the new body of Christ being created. We have the power of God dwelling in us. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 8. It's on the top of your outline there. It says, remember that Jesus Christ, remember... What happens at Easter? Let's remember Jesus' earthly ministry and his death and resurrection. That's what Easter pageants are about, remembering that. Paul says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, that Jesus, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. What do you think Easter's doing when you participate in the Easter and neglect the preaching of Paul's gospel and end with the resurrection here before the Holy Ghost was given? You're not preaching the resurrection according to Paul's gospel. You're preaching the resurrection according to prophecy, according to the kingdom message, according to Peter's involvement in the mystery. Remember, he raised from the dead according to Paul's gospel. You say, well, what does that mean? Because the resurrection, as Peter taught it, was a sure hope that Jesus would actually bring the kingdom. He says that in 1 Peter 1. You can't have a promised kingdom without a promised king. And when the promised king comes, which Peter preached, he was the promised king, and that king dies instead of conquering your enemies. What's that mean for your hope of a kingdom? Now, you know the end of the story. So you're like, oh, there's still hope. He'll raise from the dead. They didn't know that, remember. John 20, it says they didn't believe yet not the scriptures that said he would raise from the dead. They didn't believe that. They didn't know that, right? And so you're going... Hope's lost, right? The kingdom's not coming. I don't know what happened there. I mean, he came. Things were going well. I mean, he could do miracles, and that, that's a promising sign. At one point, the disciples even asked Jesus, when dealing with opposition, they said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? And doesn't that seem out of place? People were like, wait a minute, those guys, wow, that's extreme. It's not extreme when you read Isaiah chapter 2. The day of the Lord, that's precisely what God said he would do. Bring fire down from heaven and destroy his enemies. That's what they were expecting to have. They're like, you're the king. Let's do it. Let's do this thing right now. Bring the kingdom in. Let's destroy our enemies. Let's lift up the Mount Zion and all that. He didn't. He died. How foolish that seems in the light of the purpose of prophecy and the coming of their Messiah. Right? So when he rose from the dead, and then Jesus says, guys, 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 look at the prophets. It says I have to die and rise from the dead. And like, oh, yeah. Because they see him now. Right? He explains the scriptures, and now they're going, guys, he was the king, and you saw him, he saw the miracles, and all that stuff that we saw too, and so you can believe all that, and you killed him, that was a bad thing, but scripture said he had to do it, and he had to raise from the dead, and now he's going to come back and bring his kingdom. That's the message Peter preached. That's the resurrection according to prophecy. Resurrection according to mystery is, Christ died, rose from the dead, and that power that raised him from the dead will quicken your mortal flesh and put you in a new creature called the body of Christ. And you'll reside forever in heavenly places. You have all spiritual blessings, the riches of his grace, because of the resurrection. Right? It's a very different message, folks. Very different message. You see? Similarities? Yes. Jesus in both. Resurrection in both. Mystery prophecy are different. Right? So, don't suspend your knowledge of the Bible that you divided just to 
celebrate your tradition for the sake of a few good memories, right? You can have family gatherings, folks. You can rejoice in the Lord. You can proclaim his resurrection and rejoice in his resurrection and do it according to the revelation of the mystery too, you know. Okay, don't be bound by the religious man-made creation of Easter. And that's what it is. And we'll deal with that in a moment. It's man-made. The Bible did not create that. Men did. Let's just assume it was for good intentions. Forget the paganism and all that. Let's say they were doing it just because we need to want to celebrate his resurrection. Right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say to do that. They just did it. We're going to remember once a year a holy week that includes Spy Wednesday, where you dress up like the KKK, or vice versa. You've seen it, right? Spy Wednesday. Monday, Thursday, where you watch people's feed according to John 13 and 14. You know, Good Friday, which didn't really happen on Friday. This year is interesting about Friday. Good Friday is that Passover this year occurs on Wednesday. It was Wednesday, this last Wednesday. Which is how many days before today? Three. three days. That's another lesson for another day. Three days and three nights. So that happens every so often because the cycle perpetuates. This Wednesday, Passover is on, e on Wednesday. And then three days later, supposedly he rose from the dead, as far as historically. So... Anyway, another lesson for another day. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans 8, 11. I know I, I may be speaking with some passion, but I'm really, I, I don't want to be reckless. I'm not trying to destroy you. I'm not trying to ruin your life. I'm not trying to take things away. I'm really trying to edify you, to build you up with the assurance and strength of the Bible rightly divided, Christ according to the mystery, and show you how perhaps there's some remnants in your thinking, some baggage that we're comfortable with baggage. We like carrying it with us so we can open it up and say, ah, my clothes are here. You know, we like it. But if the baggage isn't right, you got to lay it down. You got to buy something new. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's what has to happen. We've done it with water baptism. We've done it with tithing. We've done it with so many different things. And this is something else that you have to do it with. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of Christ, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. And he does according to the mystery. Okay? Here, the Holy Spirit dwells on those that repent and are water baptized. All who believe the gospel of Christ in the mystery, in this dispensation, have the Spirit dwelling in them. Okay? Whether or not you're water baptized. Romans 8, 11, though, says, If the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. You see that? That's a mystery truth taught upon the resurrection, right? Jesus raised according to Paul's gospel, Romans 8. In fact, Romans 8 is impossible without the resurrection. And Romans 8 is pure mystery truth, folks. How the Spirit works in you, how you're more than conquerors, nothing defeats you. That's a hopeful message, Romans 8, when you read that. You're more than conquer. Death or disease or pandemics cannot separate you from the love of Christ. That's an amen, hope-filled message right there. And why is it true? Because of the resurrection preached according to the revelation of the mystery. Because these folks here, preaching resurrection, they still had to learn about going to the kingdom. They had to endure to the end. They had, perhaps, a chance of falling out of that highway to heaven, to earth, in the scripture. Right? But here, you're made a new creature. You are crucified with him. You're risen with him. You're part of the body. There's nothing that can remove you from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. That is a hope-filled mystery message, right, of Christ. Galatians 2.20, of course, you're crucified with him, and yet you live. The glorious preaching of the cross was not known at the cross, nor three days later. Romans 8, Ephesians 1, the mystery was not known here, and it was not known here. You say, that? yeah, we know that. Well, if you know that, then what's the deal with the Easter message? You see what I'm saying? I mean, let's be consistent with our grace understanding. Or is it just something that we use to get rid of those religious traditions we don't like, and just keep the things that we do because grace, whatever. Is that what it is? Or are we going to be consistent with what we know about the Bible rightly divided? Right? And are we going to actually practice everything in accordance to what God is doing today? Right? And preaching those good things of the resurrection according to the mystery, which makes it exceed and excel in greatness. This shutdown is causing people to question the purpose of Easter, what it really is. And if, and I say if, because not everyone even knows that Easter is about the resurrection. Right? But if they get to what Christians claim is the central teaching of Easter, if they get there, they're still in the wrong place. Do you get it? Yeah. That's the problem. 
Now, you can definitely, as a ministry opportunity, use this conversation as Christians say, well, we, we can't have our, our sunrise service, we can't have the normal religious traditions, and so we're going to boil it down to just the resurrection. And that lives in your heart, folks, and that's what you believe, and that's the true meaning of Easter. You can definitely use that as the springboard and say, yeah, and you know that Christ did everything necessary when he died on that cross. It wasn't just a cruel death, though it was, right? We preach the glory of the cross. That death accomplished everything for you. Amen. And that resurrection gives you all power that Christ had dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit. Gave you a heavenly position assured by the finished work that's called the grace of God. Amen. Right? You can use that as, as an easy springboard. Right? But do not leave them in Peter's gospel. Surely you know the consequences with that if you know how to rightly divide the scripture. Right? So that's why I'm talking to grace believers here. If I have to talk to someone who doesn't know how to rightly divide, I'm drawing a different chart and I'm explaining a different thing more in detail. So th this part, the chart should be simple to you. I'm trying to apply it to that. Now, I want to cover in the last few minutes here some Easter stumbling blocks. As most every time I talk about holy days in general, and I don't, again, I, I, I'm not trying to be anyone's Grinch. So I'm taking an opportunity today in the situation to, to have the conversation with people because someone else is the Grinch these days, right? As far as the virus and all that. But there's always a common response in people who want to defend the, the freedom and the liberty to do what they want. And, and I'm not trying to take away your liberty. I am not burning down your Easter, uh, you know, lilies. I'm not doing that. I'm not, you know, ripping off the Easter bunny hel helmet that, you know, dad wears at home to encourage. I'm not, I'm not going around doing this. I'm not knocking at home. Hey, do you have eggs at home? Get out of here, you know. I'm not an enforcer of non-Easter. That's not it. I'm trying to communicate you to be a better workman, to be a better soldier and a better ambassador and steward of the mysteries of Christ Amen. in everything that you do and in your life. Okay, but some common objections to this idea. Well, leave me alone, Justin. We just like it, no matter what you say doctrinally. Fine. I don't lose sleep over the fact that people do Easter. There's a lot of things in this world that would cause me to stay up at nights if I cared about that stuff. Okay, but I don't. I care about God's truth, and I try to do things in sight of God, and try to do things honestly towards you that you can grow in the knowledge of his truth. But 1 Corinthians 8.13 is the first objection. Look at 1 Corinthians 8.13. Now, the Corinthian church knew the liberty that God gave them in Christ. And they, they knew that they're not under the law, right? They received God's grace through the Apostle Paul, through the gospel of grace of God. They trusted Christ's cross, and then they started living however they wanted. In fact, they lived even worse, probably, than what they lived before knowing the cross, because now they knew that there was nothing they could do that could remove them from Christ. They said, well, it doesn't matter if we sin. It doesn't matter if we break our marriage relationships. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter what we do. And Paul's going, whoa, 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 grace does not give you a license to sin. Right? And not just to sin. Grace does not give you a license to sin against the weaker brother. Right? And he's talking about ministry and the purpose of grace ministry. But 1 Corinthians 8, verse 13, Paul says, Wherefore, talking about meats offered to idols, if meat make any brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. Right? Paul's telling the Corinthians, even though I know that we can eat anything we want, 2 Timothy 4 says that, as long as we give thanks over it and understand why, Right? And with prayer, thanking God for the things that is provided. But 1 Corinthians 8, verse 13, if you're eating a meat offered to idols, and that brother over there who doesn't have the knowledge that you have, right, they can be offended. They can offend by eating that meat offered to idols. Okay? Look up in verse 6. It says, There is but one God, the Father, whom are all things, we in him, and our one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him, one God, one Lord. Right? Howbeit there is not in every man the knowledge. They think that the idol is real. That's what he's saying. They think that, that that stone is like another god, like a real god, and that if I, if I come near that thing, that I'm blaspheming the true god. And so they don't. Now, you might have the knowledge there's only one true god, and these other idols are false. They're fake and false. I mean, you can go up to the stone statue of Zeus and start cleaning his nostrils. You know, it's like, it is not blasphemy to anyone, and you have this knowledge. And Paul is saying, at the time that he's writing this, that not everyone has that knowledge. They think that there's actually a Zeus there, and that they can do that, and it would not only maybe cause them danger from Zeus, but they think that that's an offense to the God they're serving, the God of the Bible, near Jehovah, because that's truly a God. I don't want to worship other gods. I don't worship the true God. Right? So they didn't have that knowledge. And so for some, with conscious of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered to idols. What's that meaning? When you're saying, go ahead, eat the meat, and they know it's offered to that idol, they're going, I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> What's the problem with that? 
It goes against our conscience, number one. And secondly, is it right or wrong that you committed idolatry? It's wrong, right? Now, can you be saved by grace by committing idolatry? Does grace cover idolatry? Yes. Grace bounds over all sin. So if grace covers idolatry, then what's the problem? You say in your Corinthian attitude, right? But there's a brother here that says idolatry is wrong. I know that's wrong. The law forbids it. This guy's telling me it's okay to eat it, so I'm going to do it, but I don't feel right about this. There's a problem there. Okay? That person doesn't, he's not, he's not, doesn't know the truth of what you're trying to communicate. Right? And he doesn't want to offend God. And you're causing him to sin. Right? That's what Paul says. This objection is, I do not want to offend my brother, is what people say. Verse 8, 13. If that be true, then why do you teach what dispensational right division teaches about tithing? You know people are offended by that tithing track that we produce every, every summer? 23 reasons you shouldn't tithe. People are offended by that because they trust their tithing. Right? What about water baptism? Why do you teach that? That offends a lot of people. A lot of Baptists are offended by what you teach about water baptism. You see, I don't buy it. I don't buy your objection and say, I don't want to offend my brother. Really? Then how in the world did you ever find yourself in a mid-Acts Pauline dispensational assembly? How in the world? Because it's like people are offended by what you teach. You get it? So if we're trying to minister not to offend people, then go back to the Presbyterian church. It doesn't matter. You, are trying to, you can believe what you, you believe personally and just practice everything that religion teaches so that you don't offend anyone. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's not saying that in 1 Corinthians 8. The offend here is not about the other person's pleasure or displeasure. It's not like someone coming to you and saying, I'm offended by you. And you go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm going to stop saying what I was saying and do what I was doing. I'm going to do whatever pleases you. You see how wrong that is? Yeah. Right? The word offend here has to do with transgression. Paul's saying, I will not make my brother to sin against God. Right? Idolatry is a sin. A sin against God. Grace abounds over it, but it's a sin. He's saying, don't cause your brothers to sin. Now, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But what's that mean for you under grace? You got to watch where you walk, don't you? Because, yeah, Christ died for your sins and he forgave all your sins, but now you're living your life and sin's still a problem because if you cause your brother to sin, that's a problem you know, for your ministry, right? So you better, you better not sin. Oh, whoa! You mean grace teaches us not to sin? Yeah, it sure does. It's not that when you sin, God's grace doesn't abound. It's that your sin has consequences even still with other people. Don't cause them to offend. Offend God. Transgress. Sin. Because he said, look, look up in verse uh, 11. Through thy knowledge shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. You're sinning against the brethren, causing them to sin. So this is why it doesn't work regarding Easter. Because Paul says in Galatians 1.10, Do I please men or please God? What's the answer? God. If Paul were seeking not to offend people in Galatians 1, he'd be saying, it's okay that gospel you preach, even though it's false. It's okay. No, he's calling, the, he says, you're a curse to be preaching the other gospel, right? That's offensive language, Paul. Yeah, but it's true. Paul stands not to offend God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians the same thing. He says, I stand before God, not men. I minister to men. I have a heart and love to try to serve to help men, but I stand to answer before God, which means I don't want you to offend God, which means your standard by grace ministry is higher than anyone else's. Does God forgive you if you walk with pagan and Wiccan, Wiccans and all that and worship the, the God of the trees? Will, he, will grace abound over that? Yes. I told you I wouldn't get into paganism. I'm sorry. If you fail to rightly divide, let's put it that way, and you start saying, we need to follow the Ten Commandments every day today. That's a failure to rightly divide. The Ten Commandments still communicate righteousness, right? Like as far as there's one God and don't commit adultery and thou shalt not kill. Yeah, that's still good and right. But you're not under the law. Does God forgive your failure to rightly divide? Yeah, he does. Grace covers that. Right? But should you be communicating that? No. Right? That's why we minister what we do. Right? We're talking to ambassadors. We're talking to ministers. We're talking to people who, who want and think about the effect they have on other people by what they do. Maybe even just your family. Right? You say, well, if I don't say it in Easter, my family is really going to be... You deal gently and aptly. And you do it from your own conscience, folks. If it's what you believe, and you communicate what you believe, like I said before, someone comes to you and says, and I have folks in my family do this, they come to me and say, you know, he's risen at Easter. I'm like, amen, yes, he's risen. He's risen, and he revealed the mystery of Christ. 
What's wrong with that? You see? Believe and walk in what you believe. That's all I'm trying to exhort here. Be consistent with our grace. You're not transgressing any law by not participating in Easter. I say it that way specifically. By not participating in Easter, meaning the traditions, the religious practices, the, the stopping here at Pentecost, you're not transgressing any law. Amen? I mean, that's a question you've got to ask, because you get blamed and suffer reproach for not participating in centuries-old Christian traditions. And every Christian does it, as if the popularity makes it right, and you get blamed as if you're a lesser Christian. Let no man judge you, Paul says, regarding any holy day. Right? Isn't that what he say? Sabbath days and all that? They're not being judged because they're keeping them. They're being judged because they're not. Right? Not keeping holy days in general, Easter specifically, is not a transgression. If you don't keep it in order to preach the gospel, the grace of God, the mystery more clearly, and someone else sees that and they have a puzzled look and you communicate why, right? You're not causing them to sin if they say, you know what, maybe I, I just won't participate in Ash Wednesday this year. You know, maybe I'm going to put aside thinking that fasting gives me spiritual benefit this year. Are you causing them to sin? No, in fact, you're purifying their doctrine, right? So, I don't buy this argument that I'm trying to not offend my brother. I get it, you don't want to start a conflict. Or another way to say that is you don't really want to raise the issue of ministry. And then sometimes you take the, the judgment call not to do that. But you have liberty to make that choice. I'm saying it in yourself, though. You've got to understand in yourself what this is all about. Let's move on here. Second stumbling block, Romans 14. Look at Romans 14. I want to hit this. It seems like I always miss this in my lessons. I, it's always at the end, and I never get to cover it, so I want to make sure I cover this. Romans 14, you know the, the, the chapter, right? Some esteem one day over another, some don't esteem every day alike. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Romans 14, in verse 5, One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. What about that, Justin? I mean, you're talking about Easter and right division. And so what if people do Easter? It says right there, let him be persuaded in his own mind. One man esteems one day above another, another doesn't. By the way, there is a, a legitimate question to ask, is if God is esteeming one day above another today. Is God doing that? The only right answer is no, he's not. Okay. To think that he is means you, you've missed something about what God is doing. So that's just put that on the table. But that doesn't even deal with the participation or practice of it. Right? But you've got to know that doctrine. If the argument is, well, God is esteeming days today, well, we have a doctrinal response to this. He is not. Okay. But let's say, well, if you're persuaded in your own mind that he does, because you don't know that he doesn't, right? You don't have that knowledge, First Corinthians 8. It says, be persuaded in his own mind. He even goes on to say in verse, um, verse 10, why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is true, which is why I, I want to help with your equipment and strengthening. But it says, why dost thou judge thy brother? Down in, uh, I missed the verse, I think. 13, thank you. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And this is the objection. They say, well, you, by not, by talking about Easter at all, are a stumbling block to me and others. You know, you're just causing people to stumble. Right, this is the objection. I don't want to be a stumbling block, so I'm going to go along with it. And by the way, you know, uh, at least it's something good, and you know, some, a, a little something's better than nothing, right? Is it? Right. This is the argument. I don't want to be a stumbling block. If it's true, you don't want to be a stumbling block. Then don't make a man-made day holy, because that's what you're doing. Nowhere in the Bible is that day, that week, holy. You say, "Well, I'm not saying it's holy." You know how many times I've read the phrase Holy Week this last week? Yeah. Well, that's just what we call it. Do words not mean anything anymore? I mean, if you don't think it's holy, then fine. You don't think it's holy. But it's like everyone calls it, meaning pastors, priests, religious leaders, Holy Week. And by the way, lest you think that nobody really thinks it's holy in that sense of the word, it's just tradition. Then why are pastors across the country arguing to have lockdowns for their protection, which they would adhere to every other weekend, have them lifted this weekend for the sake of a day? Why can't they postpone Easter until August? You go, well, well, it wouldn't be the day. I think someone is thinking in their mind there's something special about this day. Folks, there isn't. Okay. What God separates today and sanctifies today and makes holy today is not a day or a room in a building or a lamb or a water 
or an anointing oil. It is you, by the gospel grace of God, into the body of Christ. You are called into holiness every day, right? That is a much better message than, hey, can we have a Holy Week exception to the lockdown rule? Now, I'm all for exceptions to the lockdown rule, <laughs> getting out and breathing some fresh air, okay? But please don't blame God for it, right? Not because of a Holy Week. I don't want to be a stumbling block. Well, don't make a man-made day holy then. Romans 14, let me say this clearly here. It's a summary of all of our verse-by-verse -verse lessons. Is instructions to the body of Christ for how to relate to Jewish keepers of Israel's holy days. That's what it's talking about. In the early body of Christ, when Paul's ministering in Rome, there were Jews who were under the law, keeping what the law described as specific holy days that God prescribed, okay? Uh, the tabernacles, feast, Passover, these sorts of days, right? Sabbath days, all of those days were holy days, sanctified and set apart holy unto God. That was one of the commandments, Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, right? You're not under the law. There's no day you're told to keep holy because you're the one that's separated into God's righteousness and made holy, okay? That's the teaching of grace. But in that time, there were those believers. And let's say those believers either were operating around them like believers in Jesus and his death and resurrection, like Peter's folks, right? Or people who got saved by Paul's gospel, but they were Jews and they were still having struggle with the law because they lived under the law their whole life and they knew that the law was righteous and good. And so they're continuing to keep these holy days, these holy days that God told Israel to perform. What if, would have happened in Israel if they started participating in a new holy day that God did not prescribe? Well, under the law, what would that have been? A problem, <laughs> right? That's what that would have been. Romans 14 is not talking about days being esteemed that are not days that God didn't ordain. Do you get it? Romans 14 is not talking about Christmas, Easter, July 4th, or National Pancake Day. It's not talking about any of them. Do you get it? Because National Pancake Day was created by men, obviously. Men love pancakes. <laughs> and so we have a day. But nobody is saying it's Holy Pancake Day unless it's just by farce. Right? Say, what's wrong with having a day of remembering resurrection and having hope? Nothing. In fact, a month and a half ago, very presciently, before the pandemic, I taught a lesson on having hope. As good an Easter message as you want to have back there, having hope. And it wasn't on Easter, and it wasn't intended to be an Easter message, it's, but this is the idea of Easter. I think it has hope, right? The point is that hope's a message we preach. That's our message. It's the main thing. It's the hope of glory according to the mystery, right? Romans 14 is not talking about Christmas or Easter or vegans. It's talking about those who eat meat and don't eat meat. It's not talking about vegetarians, Romans 14. He's not saying, if you're a vegetarian, that's fine. That's not what Paul's saying. But that's what you'd have to conclude if you think it's talking about anything happening today. He's talking about Jews who live among Gentiles in Rome. And as a Jew under the law, since you wanted to avoid meat offered to idols or pork mixed in with your sausage, you just wouldn't eat meat. Right? That's how you were safe, because you can't, you can't you know, corrupt vegetables in that regard. It's not like you put some pork in a vegetable, and you'll see it. So you don't eat meat, you eat vegetables. So he's talking about Jews who are following the law. Jews keeping the days. And Paul says, let no man judge you. Romans 14 is not contrary to Colossians 2.13 or Galatians 4. In Colossians 2.13, Paul tells Colossians, Gentiles in the body of Christ, and he says, you, don't let any man judge you regarding Sabbath days or meats or holy days, because you're under grace, not under the law. But if you've got these brothers over here who are they're Jewish and they're under the law and they're part of the body of Christ, you know, and they're keeping those days and they're doing it for a righteous thing unto God, don't be a stumbling block to them, right? He's not talking about Christmas and Easter, folks. That's just bottom line. He's not. All right? Galatians 4, verse 10 is talking about people who observe days in Galatia. And Paul says, I'm afraid of you. You observe days, months, times, and years. I'm afraid of you. Right? Lest you receive the gospel of grace, the grace of God in vain, is what he's afraid of. Right? And so there's this idea that if you understand the gospel of the grace of God, and understand, as we've pointed out here, you'll realize that religious days, holy days, are not a part of what God's doing today. Right? If you see a Jewish brother trying to keep Passover, you should know Passover's in the Bible. God told them to do it. And if he thinks he's under the law, he's doing what God tells people under the law to do. What do you have to deal with? Him being under the law. Right? So maybe you don't deal with his day, you deal with, you know, we're under the law, we're under grace, and you deal with his doctrine. And then when he understands that, then he's like, oh, you're right, that law kind of applies to these days too, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Right? But he has to come to that understanding of assurance. 
It's not saying, hey, look, if everyone on the world celebrates Christmas and every Christian with false and true doctrine, every Catholic celebrates Easter, you should too not to offend them because you'll be a stumbling block to unbelieving and non-saved Roman Catholics. That's not what he's saying. Okay. We need to be consistent with the glorious gospel of grace. Does it align with God's will? Do the ends justify the means? You say, well, at least Easter I can talk about the resurrection of Christ. Well, that's good. But you don't have to justify every means to get there. You see, family gatherings are good. Yes, and you, know, you can gather with your family in jail too, but the means to get there is not good. Right? I mean, I, you say, we're not committing a, law, uh, you know, committing a crime. You would be these days, wouldn't you? <laughs> like in pandemics. This is why it's an opportune situation. If you had your giant family gathering, an Easter egg hunt, in certain places in the country, there's cops out there giving you fines. So it's like, you could be committing a crime. And Christians are debating, well, should we commit a crime for Easter? And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Easter? What's Easter? Right? What is that? Now, do you please men or God? God. So you've got to ask, what is God doing? Is God doing Easter egg hunts? Did the ends justify the means? Right? Is he saying, preach the resurrection and stop there? Or has he revealed the mystery about the resurrection? Right? The ends don't justify the means. And so you've got to ask those questions. Is grace something that you apply to every day of the year? Ephesians 3, verse 9, to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery, is not an Easter message. Okay? That, that's what we've seen through our chart drawing here. And people who should know better hide their charts at Easter. They'll draw a chart like from here. And we've done that before just to show you the history of it, but they'll draw this chart and ignore the mystery on this day. Why? Why do we not see that the mystery is more glorious than even the most glorious religious day that man can create? Right? Even using scripture to do it. Sanctifying days or religion, brings condemnation, is what Paul teaches. It diminishes Christ and his finished work through the cross according to the mystery. It makes the cross of Christ according to the mystery ineffectual. That's what it does, ultimately. So I'm not doing that. I don't want to do that. Well, then think about what's happening. Because, you know, hiding the gospel behind symbols and Jesus' earthly ministry and Pentecost message is doing just that, Right? Grace, consistently applied, brings freedom from condemnation. We're not doing Easter at church this year, oh no! Well, you know, just like we're a body, not a building, grace teaches us that. Grace also teaches one day is not more esteemed over another. So, you not having Easter services today? Um, grace teaches you, you're the one sanctified, not the day. You see how that frees you from condemnation? That's a good message. It's a great message, okay? It glorifies Christ. See, we glorify Christ, he rose from the dead. Yes, but the mystery message is Christ didn't just rise from the dead, he rose from the dead above all principality and power and gave you ultimate power through him. That's greater. See, glorify Christ, right? And it displays the power of his grace because you're not dependent on a day, on a ritual, on a blessing, on a religion, on it, none of that. You're trusting Christ alone, right? According to the mystery. People ask, well, will churches go back to normal after this situation because of all the changes that are being challenged and traditions that are being challenged? And my response to that is, I hope not. I hope churches do not go back to normal after this pandemic. I hope that this, this questioning of traditions, especially around Easter, continues to happen. And people say, well, we did it this way during pandemic. Why can't we get rid of that thing after? I mean, what benefit does it provide? Right? Does it, does it hide the glory of Christ? I hope they don't go back to normal. It'd be great if all the, the religious traditions and, yes, all the paganism and all the things that are relevant to the gospel disappeared from our churches. Amen. And all they preached was the clear gospel of the grace of God according to the mystery. If that's what happened, then glory to God. So I'm glad for the upheaval. Right? Not about the deaths and the sicknesses, but about religions being challenged. Yeah, I'm all for that. Right? So when the Grinch tells Easter and they're going, what's the true meaning? Well, that's a good question. Maybe... It's not really what it needs to be, right? Maybe Easter doesn't really work. You see, maybe the mystery is what we need to preach. People today need hope, and people say, well, Easter brings hope. Yes, they need hope. But hope does not come from a day or a week, folks. Hope comes from Christ, and specifically Christ in you. Hope does not come from what Christ did 2,000 years ago in his earthly ministry. Hope doesn't come from your source, something that you have to historically look upon. We trust the history of Christ's resurrection, but the hope that you have according to the mystery is from a living Christ today who dwells in you today. 
Now, your Christian friends will say, yes, we believe Christ lives today. Well, if he lives today, then what is he doing today? He's giving you hope of glory in the mystery of Christ. Clash 125, right? That's where your hope comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ according to the mystery. So, yes, they need hope. Then give it to them. Okay? It comes from believing what will happen in the future based upon the living, resurrected Christ. The hope of glory for you. Right? In you. Right? That's better than just glory, there's a rock rolled away. Yes, glory. But glory in you now, according to the mystery. You see? The life-changing power of that message. All right. Let, that's the great Easter shutdown. And what's wrong with Easter? Any comments or questions? Any thoughts? All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your truth given to us in the scripture. We thank you for uh, folks who will study these things out and knowing that we're dealing with some very massive foundation stones in Christian religion and tradition, that we'd be able to sort through what the true meaning is of these things, where they came from, and what you would have us do, most importantly, what your gospel is, so we can clearly articulate that, using the fear and the panic and the hopelessness that people have to communicate to them, using the opportunity to communicate to them the true message of, of your hope and grace, to make it clearly known, so they would trust you, Lord, uh, above uh, the things that false religion communicates to them. And we thank you for the, uh, the saints and ambassadors uh, in your body that communicate that truth, that stand for that truth, and steward your mysteries so that you would be uh, known uh, to others according to the fellowship of the mystery. Amen.